On today's podcast, I had Cuts CEO and founder Stephen Borelli on, and we talked about how he's built the brand into a nine-figure company with a potential billion-dollar valuation in the near future. And I'm really excited about this because not only do I get to talk business with you know somebody who's killing it, but I actually love the Cuts brand. Um, right now, I'm actually wearing the sweater. I'm wearing the pants. Like most of the clothes you guys see me wear during these videos is made by Cuts. So. I was just excited to come down here and see their operation and meet Steven. And it was really cool picking his brain because now he's making me think about what is possible in such a short amount of time, you know, talking about a billion dollar valuation. But along with that, we talk about how he spends million dollars or millions of dollars a month in marketing in order to get in front of people to create those sales. He talks about how he creates products, the R&D that goes into it. And also one big step that all entrepreneurs need to take whenever you're looking at a new business, we go over how to make sure that you're gonna succeed before you get yourself in too deep. So you guys wanna make sure that you stay to the end. Now, let's jump into it. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? My company, Future Flipper, can help. We've taught hundreds of people all over the country how to flip, wholesale, and buy rental properties. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. Whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your company, Future Flipper can help. We have courses, coaching, and events for all levels of investors. So if you want to take the next step, go to futureflipper.com and book a free consultation to see how we can best help you. Once again, that's futureflipper.com. If you've ever wanted to invest with me on my real estate deals, it's now possible. At Pineda Capital, we're purchasing value-add real estate all across the country. This includes multifamily, commercial, and land development. The best part is with my network, social media presence, and marketing strategies, we're able to get the very best deals that others don't have access to. You can join in with me on those deals if you're an accredited investor. If you want to learn more, head over to PinedaCapital.com to see our current opportunities. Once again, that's PinedaCapital.com. Welcome to The Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. Now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I've got somebody I'm really excited to meet. I'm actually in his office. Let's go. And uh, man, they got some cool stuff going. It is the clothing company that you guys see me always wearing. In fact, I've got the sweatshirt on. I've got the joggers on. Let's go. These guys are making the best clothes in the game, and I'm excited to pick his brain on how he built this amazing company. It's none other than Stephen Borelli of Cuts Clothing. What up, dude? Nice to see you. Nice to meet you in the flesh, and uh, just talking to you for this hour has been awesome. Yeah, so we actually filmed one for their podcast that they just launched, so we'll definitely link to that episode down below. But I'm really excited to pick your brain and how you started this brand because, you know, just hearing your story briefly about it, you know, it was like, what, six years ago? Six years ago, yeah. Six years ago, um, you guys have done over nine figures in sales, which is mm -hmm. absolutely crazy. Um, with no VC funding, mm -hmm. you tell me, start on a credit. I don't want to take the story away, dude. You tell me how this all got started. Perfect. So back in 2015, I was working at an advertising agency and... Uh, I show up, I was kind of the lowest guy on the totem pole. I was going to photo shoots, to board meetings, and I had just left a photo shoot where it was kind of hot out, so I wore a Lululemon shirt and nice jeans and nice shoes, and then um, I showed up to the board meeting, and uh, my boss looks at me and he goes, he's like, and he's, hey, you got to get out of here. You can't wear that. Get out of here. Go find something more professional to wear to work, and at that moment, I, I realized you know what, there is a really need for something professional but comfortable for the casualization of the workforce. And I was fortunate enough in 2015 to be in one of those businesses that the casualization was uh, happening probably before the masses. Yeah. Um, and so I did what any broke, uh, you know, 24 year old at the time and I moved home I went moved from San Diego drove my 2001 Jetta back to my parents house in Wenatchee Washington small little town and from 2015 to 2017 I said you know uh, I'm gonna get a job there not pay rent and just save I need to I budgeted I needed to save like a hundred grand to start the business um, and during 2015 to 2017, just really focused on learning e-commerce and uh, flying to China, Taiwan. And 
I always knew if I was going to do it, I wanted to make something truly great. I didn't want to just have another product because it needed to be that functional but stylish shirt. And so it was going to be a fabric that I, we needed to actually develop, not just to buy off the street. And so 2015 and 2017 really focused on those two things. And I call it year zero A and zero B where we were pre-revenue, but I count those as, yeah. as years where we really had to kind of bootstrap and learn the business. Then in late 2016, we launched a Kickstarter. We did around 50,000 in sales, uh, which was plus my 100,000, which was still about 100-ish thousand less than we needed to afford our first PO. And so C Carter uh, was my CPA at the time, and I said, um, you know, he gave me 20,000 bucks for a portion of the business, and we, he was my, I don't, he's not a co-founder, but he was the first guy that I brought on and right. a partner in the business. And uh, we we took the business from 2015 or 2017 to where it is now with no VC money, you know, nine figures. And, uh, you know, we focused on really making one thing great, which was the first four years. And then after the first four years, uh, years four and five, we really focused on being a full lifestyle brand. Yeah, no, I, and I've seen you guys evolve tremendously in these last few years. Um, it's funny, man, I hope you're talking about this off camera. I used to be super cheap. And so I would see your guys' clothes, um, you know, years ago. And I'm like, dude, I ain't paying 50 bucks for a shirt. Like, this is a lot of money. And then it wasn't until maybe two years ago that I finally bought one. I was like, whoa, okay. This is not your typical white tee that you get from somewhere else. Like, this is way different. It fits way better. It feels better. It looks better. Like, you know, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, shout out to you guys or for you for just having the vision to create that because it is so different than all of the competitors. You know, mm -hmm. I used to, you know, I've had Lululemon shirts. I've had all these other shirts, like you mentioned, but, um, I truly do think you guys make the best shirt in the game. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's, uh, we've been through five different variations and, you know, we're never, we're not going to be fast fashion that we have a million different items. We're going to do a few items and do them fucking great. Yeah. So tell me about, you know, that initial, um, idea with the, the company, right. You know, you're working this job and you just had this, you're like, I want to make better clothing. Did you have a fashion background or anything? No fashion background. I'm, uh, in college I worked, uh, sold shoes at Nordstrom was my most of fashion background. Uh, I was one of the sales guys at the shoe dogs that run in the, that help, uh, uh, upper level of shoes, but no fashion background and no econ background. And, but you were just like, I'm going to make shirts. <laughs> well, it was funny. I, I moved home and I started working uh, for my dad's like small business where he sold produce apples. And one thing that I took from that business to shirts was to have a great e-commerce business, you needed a high replenishment business where people could, similar to apples, if you bought one shirt, there's a high probability. If you like the shirt, we don't have to re-advertise for you. You can rebuy and rebuy yep, and rebuy. Yep. And so it was strategic in the beginning where I thought t-shirts was, even though there was a million different t-shirt brands out there, the way I was going to do it was going to lead, I was going to sell it easier, which e-commerce is undoubtedly easier. And at that time, there's actually bigger brands that told me, hey, you're not a one size fits all brand. It's going to be really hard to sell shirts online because people are going to not fit and need to return it. And so, uh, you know, I, I realized that there wasn't a lot of brands doing it at that time. So I could kind of get a head start. Um, and then, um, and then I really thought, you know, the way the world was going, it was going to position us to have success. Yeah. Just with how big e-commerce was growing. So, and the casualization of the workforce where now guys that wore suits and tie can wear a polo or a t-shirt to work. And so the market was getting bigger. Right. Yeah. That's true too. You don't have to dress as formal, but still look presentable. Mm -hmm. So you start, you decide to fund it with Kickstarter, which uh, I've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs. I've never heard of anyone doing that. So what made you do that route? It, it, I, uh, it was really the only route I knew. I was like, well, I have a hundred thousand dollars. I've saved up money. Um, you know, maybe I can get all my friends to get together to buy. The one thing great about Kickstarter is it has an expiration date. Yeah. So it makes people buy within 30 days versus if I just launched the brand and launched the uh, website, you know, that average uh, friend of mine, he wouldn't have urgency to buy. Mm -hmm. So he may never buy. So it was a good way to get friends and family and, and friends of friends to just make an action yeah. within 30 days. Well, I think the other great thing about Kickstarter um, is I always tell people this with any business, right? You want to test the demand first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so 
Kickstarter gives you that. Like, dude, if nobody would have donated, or it's not even donating, but buying, mm -hmm. if nobody would have bought, you probably would have been like, uh, this idea might not be as good as I thought. Totally. So it's a great way to test demand. And I actually, you know, one of my buddies, he tried to start a clothing company and he did it the opposite way, the old school approach of, hey, I'm going to go buy a whole bunch of shirts and stuff and then try to sell it. And I'm like, dude, with e-commerce and drop shipping, you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. You could totally test things. Yeah. And <laughs> our, we test around 1,100 pieces of new creative a week. So um, our creative team is iterating on our ads at a crazy high s speed. And uh, so our whole business is testing. And that's what's great is we've made a lot of mistakes, but those mistakes have le led to the biggest wins. And so we have a test first methodology in here. If we have a good idea, let's test it and then iterate on it and continued iterations. Um, you know, and we spend millions of dollars a month. So, yeah, <laughs> I want to I want to dive into the testing process. And, you know, I'm going to save the marketing for later because yeah. that's a whole different thing that you guys do at such a high level that I want to dive deep into. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as far as testing goes, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about like your Friday projects. Is that how you're testing? On the product side? Uh, yeah. So Friday projects is a, uh, once every Friday at nine twenty seven sixteen, we release a, uh, a new product and we started the program with hey, we, we just do shirts. How do we know our customers are going to want a bomber jacket or a sweatsuit or a vest? Um, so what we would do is we would get products to market quickly, put them up on Friday projects, and then we had an algorithm with based on the first uh, 24 hours of how many we, we sold, that would indicate whether it was going to be an item that we wanted to put it into mainline, which is into the main part of the website, or it was a product that, hey, it doesn't have legs, that came and go, and we're not going to do it. Scrap it. And the no's yeah. actually, I think, have been the biggest uh, reasons for success because it's kept us from ordering into things and wasting money. We have very little inventory that we don't sell. We, we pretty much sell out of every, everything because of that program. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. Um, for me as a customer, I, I look at those Friday projects, and I think two things. One, I'm like, dang, it's already sold out, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then two, like how the heck do they create so many color variations <laughs> of all these, like, is that economically worth it? Like, I don't know what your guys' manufacturing process is where you're able to just go drop, you know, all these new colors and stuff. Tell me about that. It, at first, I remember talking to our manufacturers before the pandemic and I would say, Hey, we're going to do things differently. Um, we, we can't pay any, uh, minimum order quantities, no MLQs that are not like, you just have to trust me on this. And at first they were like, okay, Steven, like we'll, we'll let you do it for a little bit. But then over time we built their trust and they, and we're like the, we, now we use like nine different manufacturers, but in the beginning, uh, the, the our biggest one, uh, they were like, okay, Steven, I trust you because <laughs> the orders kept coming in. And, and now we've got a leverage where our, our terms are like 120 days. A lot of our uh, the way we finance it is through our factories. So a lot of times we can make the products, sell the products before we even have to pay the money. Right. So it's like a bank. Yeah. You use. guys got an unlimited credit line. Unlimited for just credit as much line. as you could sell. Totally. And so that's been uh, a huge part of our success. But on, on the Friday projects question, um, yeah, we, 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 we test a lot of products, 50, 52 products a year. 52 products. And, and, and the color variations, it started as color variations because that was like within our scope. And now it's we're really getting into completely new product lines yeah. uh, to help us uh, kind of see how far we can push it. Yeah, because I mean, like you said, you guys started off perfecting the T-shirt. Then, you know, I saw when you guys launched these joggers that I'm wearing, I was super hyped because I was looking for a pair of pants. And, you know, these are now my I literally have them in every color. And, Let's go. uh, I love it. You know, I saw you guys launched a vest, a bomber jacket, you know, you're wearing a fleece. So it's like, yeah, you guys are becoming a full everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just got me wondering because I'm like, dude, these guys like, so I look at businesses two ways. I'm like, okay, most of the successful businesses do what you did originally in that they dominate just the one thing they Stay do really well. Simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we'll add some different colors to this and, you know, but this is our product. And now I see you branching in all these things. Mm -hmm. And so how has that been for you, like entering this new phase of your business? What I think we were able the we were able to expand because the customer gave us permission to. And so we didn't uh, just do this out of uh, lack of testing or lack of permission from the customer. I think because we we stayed focused for four years, 
the customers were we we kept hearing it over and over whether emails or on social um or you know on our ads people would say hey you guys should come out with more stuff i want to wear your brand i want to wear bottoms because i wear you know other brands bottoms with yours but you know do them in the cuts way where they're um a little bit more professional than an athletic bomber so our methodology started with t-shirts of being we're going to make things functional enough for uh, athletic items, but but they're not meant to be worn in athletic settings. So they have that comfortability factor, but they don't have that, um, call it, lack of professionalism. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I love these joggers. They're not, quote unquote, joggers that you would, you know, go to the mm-hmm. gym with. You know, these are, you know, I come into Cali on a plane flight, but I look professional. I mean, I, it's a great product. I was just curious you know, watching the Friday projects and mm-hmm. like thinking of it as a business person, I'm like, is it profitable to like create all these different new projects, mm-hmm. you know, all Great the time? Question. And because you're not selling that many compared mm-hmm. to your core products, like, and it takes a lot of R and D yeah. to go figure these things out. So is it that my assumption was it was the testing stage to go launch a yep. full product? So if you look at the individual item per Friday, you're right. They're not always profitable. Yeah. Oftentimes they're very not profitable. Yeah. But what it does is it gives us learning. So let's say we order, you know, it started out as as low as 300. Now it's like around 2000 because our volume's growing. 2000 yeah. isn't as much as it used to be. Um, so now we're at 2000. And because uh, if, if we do any less, like we, our Cabernet Bomber, we had 300 and it sold out in like a minute. So now we've moved everything to 2000. Um, but the, that is still that's not a super profitable channel but what makes it extremely profitable long term is now why, when we go to bring that item into mainline instead of taking a small bet on it we take a huge bet because we have da- data saying hey we can sell this exactly so instead of ordering you know 10,000 we say hey we can order 100,000 yeah and- you want to order 2,000 to test and then you want to go to 100 you're yep. not wasting time trying to order 20, 30, because yeah. then those will sell out soon and you have to wait. And in fashion, you know, with COVID, every, all of production lead times have gone up significantly. So your growth of your year is really based on how good your planning is and your forecast. So if we didn't have this, like I think it, it even helped so much greater during the pandemic because we had this really good data to point us, hey, make a big bet for the year. Right. So what's the lead time from R&D to launching a Friday project? Somebody has an idea today in this room. How quickly are you guys able to execute it? So we can execute a Friday project within six months. Okay. Um, COVID's pushing that to nine months a little uh, uh, to make a truly great product. But not that we cut corners on, on Friday project, but we want to get it to market quick. Right. And so we're going to overpay per unit. Um, and usually because we overpay the factories like to work with us because even on that small, it's, it's profitable for them, just not profitable for us. Right. Um, so it can take around, around nine months to create, create a new Friday project. What about just like a new color variation of a shirt? And those uh, more simple ones, those take, you know, very little because we have such high volume in the t-shirt category, Yeah. millions and millions of units. So like the factors will do us a favor because we built up that equity yeah. with them. So it, those those ones are profitable for us. How many t-shirts do you think you've sold? I think we did the math and I want to say at the end of this year, we'll do close to seven to nine million shirts. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy when it, you really think about it. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's been it's been really fun to see all the all the uh, t shirts in the in the, in the wild now. I see them everywhere. Yeah, which is cool. No, for sure. So you know, as you were growing this business, I mean, you know, you you did the Kickstarter. Obviously, you do a form of Kickstarter now in the terms of Friday projects. Yeah, it's essentially the same concept. And then you grew it from just what was the first t shirt that you did? We just did a um, just a crew curve was our first one. Okay. And then how did you transition to this like custom shirt where you could pick the collar and the, the, the bottom? Well, that was originally generated from the ideas. I was at, once I figured out I wanted to, to build a, a t-shirt company because I knew there'd be high replenishment. Uh, one of my buddies, we were at a store. His name is Chris Luna. He's one of my good college friends. And we were out and he was like, I wish I could do this shirt, but it was elongated and I wish it was a different cut. And I go, that's it. That's the name of the business. And uh, there was actually a, a, a guy in 
that worked out at Venice Beach, Jay Cutler, who had the trademark. And so I, I went to him and said, hey, I really want to start this brand. Is there any way I can, my trademark can exist with you? Great guy. And he said, his, his team was like, yeah, no worries. You, we can both exist, exist. And he signed the papers. This isn't Jay Cutler, the bodybuilder. No, it is Jay Cutler, the bodybuilder. Oh. Yeah. You, I just had him on the podcast last week. He probably doesn't even know this happened because it was through his team and he, it was one quick conversation, but yeah, he, he let it go through. I'm going to have, I'll have to call Jay and ask him if he remembers. Yeah. Literally, we just, uh, had him on the podcast talking about how he, you know, became Mr. Olympia and did all his, yeah, he's a beast. He did. He's still a beast. Tell him thank you. I will. Yeah. I'll tell yeah. him that. <laughs> So, I never talked to him. I talked huh? to his team, and uh, he has he had cut apparel. We wanted cuts clothing, and uh, he, uh, we just uh, agreed that we both could use the the trademarks, which is cool. That is cool. Yeah, no, Jay's a cool dude. So you start selling shirts. You you figure that out. Um, the big thing that for me that stuck out to you guys not only just having a great product, right? I say this all the time, like. It's not the best product that wins, but it's the best marketer that wins, mm -hmm. especially in today's society of social media. And if you have both, if you're a great marketer and you have a great product, then you're going to kill it. We all know that I love creating passive income through rental properties, but did you know that you can create passive income through owning an e-commerce store? My company, Lunar Ecom, can build and manage a store for you on Amazon or Walmart. We'll handle everything from starting the store, picking the products, and all the day-to-day -day operations. It's completely passive for you. If you'd like to learn how store owners are making thousands a month in passive income, head over and watch the case study at LunarEcom.com. It will explain everything you need to know about the industry and why I'm so excited about it. So to see the case study, head over to LunarEcom.com. Most people want to get rich at all costs. They make sacrifices with their family, their health, and their faith, all in the pursuit of money without even realizing it. But what if I told you it doesn't have to be that way? What if you could grow your wealth in all areas of life? Well, it's possible, and that's why I created The Wealthy Way. It's a community of people striving to grow together in all areas. And we have multiple tools free to use that are completely free. You can get access to The Wealthy Way Planner, where you can set goals and hold yourself accountable on a daily basis. We also have our Wealth Builder Academy, which is over four hours of content teaching you how to manage your time, create the right goals, and all the biggest secrets I've used to grow my life, not only in my net worth, but in all aspects. Lastly, we have our Discord community where thousands of wealth builders are all over the world encouraging one another and growing together. And once again, all of this is completely free. There are no upsells, there are no hidden catches. For me, this is a passion project and I wanna build a community of like-minded people. So if you wanna start living the wealthy way today, go to wealthyway.com. There you can get all the free resources like the course, planner, and Discord community. So go to wealthyway.com. Mm -hmm. So you, just listening to your story, came from the advertising agency. Yep. So you already had marketing you know, expertise um, in that sense. So tell me about that. Yeah, uh, I was on the bottom of the totem pole at the Lambesis agency, which is a branding agency. And they were like, hey, all these companies want social now. So they're like, hey, young kid out of school, why don't you do social? And I started learning how to do it there. And I quickly realized like this thing's gonna, I saw the opportunity, like this is gonna be huge. And by 2016, I'll, there was other uh, e-com success stories. We definitely weren't the first, but it was still so, so much more new than it was now. And uh, I really wanted a, a product that I could e spend even more time on and, and really exploit the, the new technology. And so that's what really gave me my first little, hey, I think I can do this. Yeah. So tell me about that. Like, what was the first strategy to go get customers? So I think even before that, and I learned this from the branding agency, the way you position your brand in the marketplace, it can make or break you. If we would have came out with our shirts and said, hey, you can take, you can work out in them and you can take them to the office, consumers' minds don't work that way. I'd be like, no, you can't. Yeah, and, <laughs> and or it would devalue our business. Yeah. We have a lot of competitors out there that do do that. And they yeah. say, hey, you can wear it to work out and then wear it to a date, but people aren't going to want to take the shirt that they wear to the gym <laughs> and sweating and then take it on when they got a hot date. No. It's just not going to work like that. So, uh, you know, we are, our mission is to operate, to inspire those to operate and win at the sport of business. So we want to stay in that lane yeah. of, of creating clothes of the modern day guy who lives in the sport of business. And, and that does include taking girls on dates and looking good. Yeah. That's, that's the sport of business. You're on the go from working to date 
in in a quick uh, um, in a quick second. And so I think before we even get into the how we market, understanding what your brand position is is so important for the get go because it also affects the price point. If we would have said we're a gym shirt, the pro- no one's going to buy a fifty dollars shirt then. Yeah. So it, it really does like that's the that's the roots of which brands are built on and the the best brands know who they are and they stay there and they and especially from a marketing standpoint they don't go to these other areas so i'll play devil's advocate do you guys i'm sure you guys have struggled with the uh temptation to do it but have you ever thought about doing a gym shirt we we get that question (laughs) all the time and uh because i would love the cut as a gym shirt we we get we we get that all the time and there's been other brands that try to go from like premium brands to gym and we think f- we could do it. We know how to do it. But for us to be the best at company in the world at operating the sport of business, there's so many more products that we can create that can uh, f- fulfill that mission that we don't want to too quickly go into um, uh, athletic apparel. So if you ever did do athletic apparel, um, which it sounds like could happen down the road, do you think that you would keep it under the Cuts brand or do what these big companies do and start a whole new sister company? Hopefully one day we'll, we'll just have to, we'll be able to acquire one under our, our, okay. our name. Our, our goal is to be a billion dollar brand. And, you know, I don't think we're that far away from a, a, a billion dollar valuation. We're, you know, two, three years away. Um, and so we, we, we want to be one of the brands that uh, acquires and creates like a holding company for um, what we're, what we're trying to do. And yeah. you're, you're starting to see it a lot. Uh, yeah. What do you think about all of the influencers and people who are wearing your stuff? Because I mean, like you said, you see it out everywhere. Um, and I mean, like, are you paying these guys? Everyone's just choosing to wear it. Like, how's that going? So we have a uh, top down and bottoms down approaches twofold where we started the brand with no money. Yeah. So we would, I always say tell this story uh, on Christmas Day in 2017, Patrick Mahomes posts and he's wearing cuts with his girlfriend, and so then we look on our website and he was like one of our first like first, you know, 10,000 customers or whatever. So then we DM him and we're like, hey man, we got more where that c- came from. Whenever you want shirts, let us know. And uh, over the years, he's been a, a DM friend of ours where yep. we're. We're friends on DMs, and you know, after the game, we hit him up that crazy game, and you know, he said appreciate you, and we sent him a new package, and uh, we really focus on just the one of one approach towards macro influencers, mm-hmm. where we can't pay them, but we'll provide convenience for them, and new, whenever we have new stuff, they get it. Yep. Um, you know, a guy like Mahomes, he we can't we can't pay him. We can't pay him. <laughs> yeah. He, like even five mil bucks to him, he's making five hundred million over yeah. the course of this ten year contract. Like he's just not going to do it. Yeah. He, and so uh, we would rather just have him be seen in it yep. as our approach than to waste all of our marketing budget on one person. Right. Um, then we have you know we do work with uh, at this point you know tens of thousands of micro ambassadors yep. that we exchange free product for. Um, and then based on how they perform, they can work up the chain to pay deals. Yep. Um, and so it kind of is a growth strategy and, you know, it's pretty cool. We've taken some, um, micro ambassadors and now they make two, three, 4,000 a month and we're their primary income. Wow. And so, um, it's, uh, it's a, and again, that, that promotes our, uh, we inspire, uh, and drive more people into the sport of business as, as, as a mission of our business. Yeah, no, I love that. So speaking of marketing, uh, you mentioned earlier that you're spending millions a month on marketing. So break that down. Like how, how much are you guys really spending and how is it being spent? So our media mix used to be like almost a hundred percent on, uh, like Facebook and Instagram and slowly it's gone more into TikTok. We're actually on TV commercials now as well. Oh really? I didn't um, know that. Yeah. We, we just started on, uh, it's not, it's more, uh, it's not national, it's YouTube TV. So there oh, yeah. is a little bit, it's not as clean as attribution as Facebook, but there is decent attribution where you, it, directionally you can see if uh, TV commercial is doing good or not. Um, so uh, slowly it's gone, you know, f- uh, Instagram and Facebook's more around like 30, 40% of our budget. And then th- through influencers, TV, podcasts has been big. We've been on Rogan, we've been on Ben Shapiro, some of the big- uh, You just buy an ad there? Yep. Okay. And and podcasts is, is is been such a big channel for us on, on spending, um, which is interesting because they yeah. can't even see it. They can't, they can't <laughs> see it, but they trust the person. Yeah, yeah. So like you know the Rogan 
uh, fans, like they're like Bible. It's like <laughs> what, if he says something, it's like they believe it. Yeah. Um, and some of the other shows uh, are like that, and and they're not cheap. You know, they're yeah fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand for you know an ad read, but the the results, the return is way worth it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool to know. Um, as somebody who's gone through all these shifts, and, and, right? and yeah. one thing I would say with the media mix is if you just did one of those, they all compound on each other. So if we just did podcast people, or if we did that first, it wouldn't work because now it works because people have probably seen our, our Instagram on their phones. Yep. And then occasionally they see it on sports center or sports shows. And then when they're on their favorite podcast listener, they see it there and like, Oh, I got to buy it. It's everywhere. So we yep. try to be everywhere to the people uh, operating in the sport of business. Yeah. And that was the thing we were talking about when we first met is like, you were like, dude, I saw you on TikTok, And then I saw you on this and I'm like, dude, I saw you guys on TikTok, and <laughs> I, I saw it. you on this. And when it comes to marketing, that's what you want to happen. You have to just be omnipresent because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you can dominate a certain niche, but at the end of the day, if you're only relying on Facebook ads, we know, they can change tomorrow. Like and iOS has changed everything recently, right? Oh yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. in September we got hit, and we always say we're not a we're not a, a clickbait brand in a way. We're a brand that's going to last generations. So we're we're built to withstand uh, iOS change. We'll just switch budget around to the the channel that can work. Uh, you know, on Facebook before the iOS, there was a lot of businesses that were ticky tack uh, and and growth hack. Uh, type of spending where they would be really uh, interest targeting and, and that was and we and we benefited from that in the early days but now our campaigns are very much 18 to 65 broad and we just spend it really spend it home yeah mm. what do you think's the demographic well you would know but what what is the demographic uh, so even though we uh, we do 18 to 65 because we're trying to get out we're trying to expand our market but it's not necessarily because we think that's our mark our, our our core customer. The way that Facebook algorithm works is it's going to, if you start broad and it's going to slowly come down to who your market is, because based on clicks, then it's going to push it towards those audiences. Yep. But our core market's uh, 25 to 40. Yeah, that's what I figured. Mm -hmm. So speaking of demographics, what about the women? W women we're working on. Um, women's is going to be quite a bit different than men, but it's still going to be that overall mission of uh, work to play attire. Yeah. Uh, August. 15th ish it's gonna drop oh really yeah so it's that my wife will be happy man we'll, we'll get her a pre-box to sample it and yeah we'll, we'll 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 love to do that yeah no that's cool i didn't expect that answer i thought you were gonna say yeah you know kind of like the athletic thing like yeah. you know we're just only focused on this but that's cool that uh we we had we had a, a large debate about it and you know there's been other brands that uh have done only men's and have been really successful when you when you walk down Rodeo Drive, you don't see one brand that only has men. Not to the be the billion dollar valuation that you want. We're not. We got to have females, and we got to kill it. So, and I, I think that's so important for young uh, young entrepreneurs to have. We have a big ass goal of being a billion dollar brand. Yeah. And that and I, I have a sign in my office right when I started. I wrote a big B when I got when we got our first office and we were a two million dollar business. And I said, that's why we're here every day. And the talent we attract wants to be a part of a business like that. Yeah. And so we set that big goal. And it's crazy over the course of five years, you get closer and closer where it's not a single B anymore. We want to go live at multiple Bs now. Yeah. What What is the end goal? I mean, obviously, the valuation is just one thing. Like, is it to go public? Is it to sell? Like, what do you, what's we, the end goal? I, you know, we're still, it, it get it, the, the, the finish line kind of gets longer as you yeah. get going. Cause at first, when I first started, I was like, Hey, you know, I want to sell this business for a hundred million and get a hundred million valuation. Cause that was the context of which I saw other e-commerces go. And once we kind of, our growth was much faster than a lot of ones I used to compare to. So I was like, okay, well I need to change that, that, that goalpost. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really loving this now. And, uh, you know, my, my incomes changed my, uh, the opportunities that I've come about, have really changed. And I think cuts for me personally is going to be a great vehicle to make connections like you. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give that up yet. And I feel like, uh, my vision it, it, for me personally, uh, needs cut. Like I want cuts to be much bigger before I, I write a check. You know, I want, I want, uh, it to be a generational brand. I want that from my, my pride. That's what I want. Yeah. 
And so uh, I think the end goal right now is at least a billion dollar exit or an IPO. And in fashion, it's more likely that it would be an IPO. Once you get to that size, there's less buyers. Yeah. Um, and no one, it's just a little bit harder of a, a acquisition. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you guys IPO, you guys let me know, dude. A hundred percent. I'm ready. Um, the other thing I was wondering too is, you know, with what everything you guys have got going on, um, how does it all work on the, like, we're talking about the business side and the marketing and, you know, testing products and everything, which is my, you know, the thing I always enjoy, but I've always wondered with fashion, like the R and D element of this, like how the heck are you guys making such great clothing that fit? And mm -hmm. like, how does it, how do you make this vest? Like, what does it start? How does it start? So it all starts with raw materials. We like a lot of brands, they'll have their factory just, uh, find fabric and then make it. We, we have, uh, material developers that test rigorously. Uh, um, and we have a, a office in Hong Kong as well that, uh, it, that we just opened up that does a lot of the testing for us. Um, and we'll test it on 17 different machines and like the stain issue. That was one we were like, guys, we got to get to the bottom of this. this we got to fix this. So, um, we first start with the raw materials and then, you know, it's funny when you look at the care label of a shirt, so much more goes into it than just the, the care label. It's how the, the raw materials are weaved together, the tightness of which you, the machines use, the thread count. And so, um, we, we look at all of those to, to make a garment. Yeah. And that's kind of what's been crazy to me is like watching all these different companies, and their blends because you know it's i don't know it sounds like this was for you too lululemon for me was like the first one was like man like these shirts are different than yeah. everyone else's like these are nice and then you know you start seeing your brand and other brands and you're like man everybody's like now got a different feel to their shirt like fit is one thing i understand that you know you can make the proportions a certain way but the feel of like how to blend the cottons and the polyesters together i'm like how do they do that? Mm -hmm. Is it just testing? Like, let's try 10% here. Yep. 100%. Let's try 80%. That felt good. So we, our Pika Pro shirt, mm -hmm. we started with Pika, then Pika Tencel, then Pika 1, 2, and 3, and now we're on Pika Pro, which is like the fifth rendition of it. And so all of that was like testing with the different percentages, the different weave tightness, um, you know, the type of spandex. Um, we've uh, since upgraded to, a, um, I'm not going to say it, but a, a better, <laughs> yeah. a better spandex. Um, so, uh, you know, all that goes into the equation of creating great products. And I think our approach is to go deeper and, and fewer products outside of Friday project, like mainline and yeah. truly create exceptional things. What do you see happening with, I guess the future of, let's just call it the t-shirt because for, for all intents and purposes, the t-shirt hasn't changed for a mm -hmm. hundred years. Like it's looks the same. Yeah. It fits different. You've got different materials. Do you ever, and this could just be a fashion thing, but do you ever see the t-shirt like changing dramatically? Like some new innovation of like, dude, nobody's ever done this before. This is how a shirt should be. I, I would say yes and no on the no side uh, if you look at the course of the last hundred years, like people wear t-shirts, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, the way in which they wear them has changed, which is gave, gave us a white space where now the professional shirt that doesn't wrinkle is acceptable at work. So in that way they changed, I think fits will always get looser to baggier and we'll be ready for whatever's those. in fashion. Yeah. Um, I don't think the working guy like us is going to go too baggy ever. Yeah. It might be a little more baggy, but it's not going to be like sloppy. Yeah. Um, so I think that market, and that's why we love it, it because it's allowed us a lot of security and our number one item is the number one item in everyone's closets outside of hosiery. So there's, it gives us a lot of peace where like from an investor standpoint, if an investor, even though we haven't done a uh, raise, they would look at us and say, you're a pretty safe fashion business to work in because you're not a trend based business. You're a replenishment based business. So from that regard, we're, we're, we're very excited about the lane we're in. Uh, on the no side where I think it could change is from like the NFT side and w the, your t-shirt represents a lot about who you are. So I think if, if you could one day scan the shirt and someone could tell about like the brand you're wearing that that's in a way at which I think, you know, you could get access to certain things and 
have uh, have uh, a new moment in time, which could be really special for that person. Yeah, that's interesting. So you mentioned that you guys are a replenishment brand versus um, a trend brand. So um, this makes sense because, you know, obviously shirts wear down over time. So you buy more shirts and mm -hmm. other things versus the Louis Vuitton shirt. You know, I'm hoping that this thing lasts me a very long time. Uh, have you ever thought about doing like an ultra premium brand? I think it wouldn't be under the. I I was funny. I uh, when I got my first bonus, like my real first check, uh, I uh, I walked down Rodeo Drive. I was like to my girlfriend, I was like, "Let's just go buy something," you know. Yeah. And I did have a little bit of a. I bought, ended up buying a, a wallet, um, like a, a, a Louis Vuitton like wallet, just as a memory. Yeah. Um, and. And we, I, I got, I was like, you know, creating a luxury brand would be pretty fun. You know, you're, you're not worried about volume because everything's so expensive and it's like a cool thing to, to, to say. So what, maybe one day we, we, we could do it, but, uh, you know, again, I think there's so much legs left and cuts that we just want to make yeah. sure to stay in that lane. I'm curious, like even with these, you would know really well, but like uh, take a Louis Vuitton shirt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it the same cost and materials, everything? Yeah, maybe it's even ju cheaper. Like I look, I was looking at their stuff, and the actual cost of making it is ridiculously <laughs> cheap. <laughs> <laughs> the margins, man. Yeah, they I could only like a, dream of it. A twelve thousand dollars shirt, uh, or a twelve hundred dollars shirt for I mean, it cost them ten bucks to make, maybe. <laughs> Dude. And they sell a lot of them. The luxury market's crazy. There's you know? there's a reason that guy's you know Bernald is a, uh, I don't know how many billions he's worth, but <laughs> like. Yeah. 100 billion i think or something crazy they, they do have to deal with ca the counterfeit world when i was in shanghai one time i went to the largest counterfeit mall and it wasn't like a mall like it was legit like they would have louisville signs out really that said like louisville uh, louis, louis vuitton, vuitton uh, gucci and they're and you, fake and you thought they were like real stores that's how nice they were and you would go in there and they would sell you you know stuff i bought a bunch of stuff about my girlfriend <laughs> uh, uh, the purse is 200 bucks or, or yeah or less like you're negotiating two purses for 200 bucks or something like that uh, and they look the exact same and they're pretty close so they, they do have to deal with that um more so than counterfeit cuts wow oh you guys deal with that too not, not as much but uh that and that's where i think the nft could really help authenticate yeah. the brand and i think more and more companies are going to do that because it really would, uh, if every purchase had was linked to an NFT, just for simply uh, the fact of uh, the authentication, even if it never gets sold again, that's valuable to a customer. Right. Because there's 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 you know other brands we don't have this problem. There's fake websites out there that look like your brand. Everything about it. They have a great dev team. So you know th there there is an aspect of authentication that's important. From the outside looking in, an amazing businessman like you are. Walk. How would you? utilize let, let's talk about a little bit about what we were talking off screen of how to create cuts in the metaverse like a store and what would that look like yeah so i think there's going to be a lot happening in the retail space um it's interesting because cuts is an e-commerce brand okay so you guys don't have retail stores that i'm aware of <laughs> um so instead of just leasing out this retail space doing this stuff being only accessible to people in that city you could very easily go to the metaverse and create your first quote unquote retail store. And you're going to be able to have all your customers go there and be attracted to it. Now in that store, obviously they can go shop around, they can buy stuff. That's really cool. But I think you could also gamify your building as well. And mm -hmm. people could, you know, with each, whatever, each item they purchase in the metaverse, they don't get this on the website mm -hmm. or anything. You give them an incentive to go there. To go there. Um, they wow. get one, you know, slot pull or something, right? Something that you put with cuts. And with that, it just does a raffle and it's like, boom, you won a bomber jacket, you won joggers or no, you didn't win anything, right? You know, the math has to make sense, but, uh, I think you'd get more sales, you'd get more traffic there. And then along with huge that community as well, huge community. And that's just like the tipping point of what you could do there's so many other things where now you're bringing the big key that people don't realize about nfts is that you're trying to bring the community together in one place right now i can't go network with other cuts 
you know, enthusiast. Mm -hmm. There's no place to do it. And so when you're able to start creating these places where people can network and because they're just fans of the brand, right? Like, you know, even like Louis Vuitton and these companies, it's not like there's no Louis Vuitton place where we can all go and, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, dude, if you buy Louis Vuitton, you're probably very like-minded. Yeah. If you buy cuts, you're in the sport of business, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we're having such a good conversation. Love it. So I just think that if you can incorporate the community, if you can incorporate a reason to go there, it's going to make things even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've we recently launched a, a Discord page yep. for that reason, and it's taken off. We've only had it up uh, since we have like 2,000 people in it from uh, – from our, we launched a cuts carpet diem, which is a challenge for all of our uh, uh, customers, and yeah, we, we that's like a huge initiative for us is to build up that Discord. I'm kind of giving away the strategy a little bit, but uh, if we can build up the Discord to you know tens of thousands of yep. people, then we launch our NFT. Yep. Then we there's already a audience that's and Discord's very that community. Yep. Then we'll have a larger chance of success. So we we are starting it and. Uh, curating the, the the community, yep, and then it'll be ready for the launch. Yeah, I can tell you, I just launched a Discord too about um, three weeks ago or four weeks ago, and um, yeah, we've got about five thousand now. And Amazing. I'm not I'm not giving away what will happen in that community, but you know, there's going to be some cool things for everybody. Love it. I'm gonna have to yeah. join. Can I get the invite? Yeah, dude, I'll shoot you the invite. Perfect. So my last question is, you know, obviously you guys are already building such a huge e-commerce company, but for somebody who wants to start an e-commerce company, specifically clothing, because I, mm -hmm. I meet a lot of people who want to start clothing, what would you recommend? So I would recommend that if you're going to start an e-commerce company, you first, it's got to be something you're passionate about. Fashion for me was something that maybe it wasn't like I, I was most passionate about sports, but it was something I was passionate enough that I was like, I could do this for a long time. And uh, maybe a quick little backstory. When I was selling apples, I would go to convention centers and there was like older guys. And I was, I remember telling my dad, I was like, this isn't the community that I want to live in. Right. You know, uh, this is not who I am. Right. So cuts is very much, you know, business driven and what my interests are. And it was something that I felt like I could do for 20 years. So uh, if you're going to start an e-commerce company, make sure that first checkbox of does it, is it a community and a type of person that you could do for a while? Because you don't want to do something just for the money. And then you get a couple years into it and you're like, I'm not really into this yeah, anymore. I don't know why I did this. It, it's just not going to be fun. So that's the first thing. Um, and then I would, I always say this is, Understand the business model you're in. Understand that there's a CPA cost. Understand that there's shipping and logistics cost. I see so many young brands don't consider all those other costs. They think, oh, it's a hundred dollar shirt. I got it for five bucks. Boom. I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna make you know, you know, eighty bucks on it or something. There's so many other costs that can you can start with a negative, and then it's really hard. You told to me your marketing budget. Per month, you know, yeah. that's a huge cost. A huge, co yeah. I mean, exactly. <laughs> to to get in front of you, it's gonna, it's it's it's, it's, it's tremendous. So understand how the uh, so the first thing's passion, then understand the business model. If those two things you really have a good grasp of, then just focus on product market fit and understanding where your white space in the market is and brand positioning, and you can have success. That's it. And the only thing I would add to that is test it. And then yeah, product market fit to testing, hundred percent. Yeah, because a lot of people, man, they. Like, I know what I want to do. Here's the business plan. I'm going to go put in an order. It's like, I don't think you have to do that, you know? And and try to start fast. Like, one one thing I love about what all your experience is, you know, over the course of the last two years, you've done so much. You've created three different companies. And it doesn't seem like it takes a ton of, uh, I, although it, I'm sure it takes a ton of time, it's come so naturally to the skills that you've developed. And that's, what, that's the one thing that's great about business is, one thing can lead to the next because you you understand where value how value is created. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So once you got those skills, it gets easier and easier to just keep reusing them over and over again. I think we're gonna do some business work together. This is gonna be fun. Yeah, dude, I'm excited. Well, man, uh, I'm a big fan. I, I was happy to have you on the podcast, dude. I think every, anyone listening, it's just such a tremendous story to to go from you know just six years ago to potentially a billion dollar company here in less than a decade, like absolutely insane. Um, and also too, just the product. I can't wait to see what other products you guys have. Cause I want to wear them. Love it. Now, well, did, 
We got to take you to our showroom. Yeah, we're going to check out the showroom after this. So, guys, uh, make sure you guys go follow Cuts. Check them out. Uh, we'll link to them all down below. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next episode. See you. Thanks. Thanks for watching The Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.